Thanks everyone for joining. This is uh, Symbiosis 2 and we are very, very happy today. So honored to have Gerald Black with us to talk about the, um, uh, the alphabet looking back and looking forward. So over to you, Gemma. Uh, thanks so much, Dorothy. And I must say, thank three people. Um, without you, Dorothy, we wouldn't be here today. Without my two beautiful uh, mentees, uh, Bernice and Susie Ann, if I didn't have you, I wouldn't be here today. So thank you, all three of you. Uh, let's jump right in. But uh, one of the things that I'd like you all to have at hand is a notebook of some description so that you can take notes. Um, I'm, I've got a lot of images to show you, and I'd really like you to jot down things. Uh, some of you are pretty quick with taking screenshots. If you want to do that, you can do that. I don't mind. Um, also, what was the other thing? Um, there's always the recording as well. So, but take notes or take notes in the recording. Uh, what you should see on your screen now is my first image. This is a little something that I wrote, um, not the zeitgeist. Well, yeah, I did the zeitgeist, but the evolution of the Western alphabet is a wonderful story of 26 letters, each with individual character and purpose, a magic, majuscular journey of time, peoples, culture, and creeds. Uh, I wrote that about... I don't know, 20 years ago. And to me, it's it's still the same journey. So what we're going to do in this little chat is talk about the alphabet, but not in a sense of this is where A came from, this is where B came from, this is where C came from, and so forth. And um, we're not going to actually analyze the letters. We're going to look at the alphabet from a calligrapher's point of view, from um, so that you can start uh, jotting down ideas and notes of where you want to look at, where you want to learn, where you want to travel to, um, and what's important in Western lettering. So uh, I'm leaving out uh, the major alphabets like the um, Oriental alphabets, the, um, the Middle Eastern alphabets, which are all extremely value, valuable in communication throughout the world. I am only looking at um, a Western alphabet uh, point of view. However, I am going to start with the letter A. The Lascaux Cave, many of you will have seen an image like this in the Lascaux Cave. It's one of the uh, earliest depictions of um, hand painting. Um, this one was said to be one of the oldest uh, cave paintings, but as with everything, technology has proven that there are older, and even here in Australia, we have older cave and rock paintings than this one. Um, and even in Europe, they have older, uh, it's been proven that there are older uh, cave paintings as well. And throughout Asia, there are a myriad of early cave paintings going back way beyond this time period. But for us as calligraphers and in the, the Western alphabet, I've started with this particular uh, painting because it is from the head of the aleph, the ox, that we get our first letter. Don't mind uh, me preaching to the converted. Some of you will know some of these things. Uh, some of you will know a lot of these things and some of you won't, will, won't know any of them. Well, I'm sure you all know something um, that I'm going to speak about. But there are little things along this journey this afternoon that I think you will really enjoy. So taking that Lascaux cave, um, you can see the relationship of the head of the oxen 
and this particular shape here. This is a piece of work that I did in the 1990s and it's still in situ in a place in Sydney uh, called um, uh, Primrose Park. It's where the Australian Society of Calligraphers have their home. Um, and here you can see I've used the letter A in its historical value, starting with the ox head and then moving through to the Trajan style of the letter form A. And in this little um, series of letters here, we're counting down through the centuries, right up until we hit the printed letter A here. Calligraphers, call us what you like. Calligraphic designer, calligraphist, letter, letterer, maker of written artifacts. That term was coined by um, my very good friend, Ewan Clayton. And I love that term, maker of written artifacts. So whatever it is that we do, someone else is going to see it at some stage, okay? Don't ever throw anything away, keep everything. Script artist, lettering artist, letter designer, scribe, scrivener, text designer, text artist, penman, copyist. Um, the image that I've put alongside all those names, doesn't really matter what we're called, is this fantastic fresco that I'm sure you've seen before at the Pacus Proculus in Pompeii. So we know that prior to 79 AD, all these frescoes had been painted um, because that was the time um, Vesuv of Vesuvius erupted. So what these this couple are depicting is a little wax um, holder here. In, this opens up, so there's a tablet of wax inside. She is holding the stylus and he is holding a scroll. So we know that this couple are actually in the business of writing. And here's a fairly typical image of um, a wax tablet with little inscriptions. And what can be done with the wax after the inscription's been written or practiced, it can be rubbed over, remelted and new writing created. This is an image I took from one of my little old books of the scribes of Thebes. You can see that they are so keen to write down what it is they're supposed to be writing. Let me just show you or tell you exactly what it is they're holding. This little section here depicts um, a, a wooden tablet in which it has two holes. And the two holes are for a black and for a red or an ochre, a red ochre. And here is some type of reed pen that would have been used to, to write on the papyrus. Here, I've got a feeling that we have a, a a piece of papyrus. This scribe again is hanging on to their, their little tablet with the two holes for the inks. Right? You can see the eagerness in these scribes. They really want to do what it is they're set out to do. Who knows, they might get lashed if they don't. <laughs> I, I don't, this, this image needs no introduction whatsoever. The hieroglyphs, the early pictograms have given us a starting point for, uh, mind you, uh, there were inscriptions well before this time, but this work on papyrus starts to give us meaning to the communication that the alphabet developed from. And again, you can see that very depiction of the little wooden tablet, more than likely wooden tablet with the two holes for a black and a red ochre, 
Mm -hmm. You can also see in the images here, the use of the black to create the symbols or glyphs, if you like to call them, as well as the, uh, the little uh, rubricated letters or the red uh, letters. Cuneiform was a, a method of communication where a small wedge shaped uh, piece of wood was created to press into wet clay. Now, one of the things that cuneiform did, um, it was the cuneiform tablets were used in trade and trade really built up a communicative um, transformation of, of letter form that moved from country to country, from place to place, where tribes or um, farmers or people taking their goods to market would have a small clay tablet. And on that clay tablet would have been incised by a little um, triangular wedged shape implement. Um, the amount of, uh, of cattle the person was drawing with them across the country or the amount of, of produce the person had with them. So once that cuneiform tablet got to the other end, they knew that this was an honest trader and it had the trader had what um, they set out with at the start. And so it became an item of trade uh, it also became an item. Uh, what happened then after that was that the tablet that was um, reclayed or a new slip put over the clay and a new message uh, uh, put into the incised into the clay. Um, pronounced cuneiform. What you can see here are some Greek letter forms. And one of the, the parts in our history of Western lettering that is missing, we know a lot about Greek lettering and we know a lot about Latin or Roman lettering, but it's the Greco-Roman or the Greco-Roman period of combination of letter form because one didn't develop without the other. The Roman letter forms came uh, from the Greek letter forms. And so there is a period that is being looked at by one of my colleagues, uh, Georgia Angelopoulos. So watch out in the future for information coming out about the Greco-Roman period, which links the Greek alphabet with the Roman alphabet, um, where I'm talking from a calligrapher's point of view. Academically, no problem, but from a calligrapher's point of view, we need to be able to see clearly the lineage between the two. The word that you can see here is bostrophodon, and that indicates to us the way the writing was created. And it means, the word itself means as the ox plows. So usually in Greek tablets, you would have the writing starting here and it would move along the line, come down and move in this direction and then come down and move in this direction. And it was a very common way of um, Greek writing, Bostrophodon. Um, and this is just a close up of the type of um, carving that the Greek letters had. So we're looking pre-BC here, we're looking um, 2000 BC here. Um, and letters that you can see that are familiar for all of those who can read uh, Greek. This image is uh, not foreign to you. You understand what Greek lettering looks like. You're all aware of uh, the enormous influence that um, the earliest Olympians, the Greek Olympians had it, you know, every four years we have the Olympic Games. We owe so much to these early um, Olympians. And here you can see depicted, so this is a piece of sphere that was created around about BC 500. 
and you can see that they are obviously Olympians or athletes and that we have a discus thrower here. Um, and there's a Greek inscription that runs around the top here that actually says um, something to the effect of, I am the owner of this boy. This boy um, uh, plays the game on my behalf, which is quite an interesting Greek <laughs> inscription, I'm thinking. However, it, it shows a very human side uh, to, to that time period that we owe a lot of our lettering to. This will not be uh, unfamiliar either, the Trajan inscription. Um, the, the, the anglicized way of pronouncing it is, is Trajan. It is, was never pronounced that way, is Trajan. And I think you'll find that the Italians pronounce it uh, even more correct. Um, the, the J, of course, was not pronounced as a J as we know it. And the reason why the Trajan in, uh, inscription is so important, this is actually the column. It is in the R Roman Forum. For those people who've been fortunate enough here in the audience to have been there, uh, you will know that the inscription that we all refer to as calligraphers is actually just here on this tiny little section down here, just above the doorway. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was really interesting is you can see the doorway here and the inscription had to be cut into because the doorway didn't fit. And so we lost some of the letter form. If you get a chance to go to Rome, go to the Roman Forum. Here is the inscription. So what's all the fuss about? The fuss is that the Roman letter form is at its um, prime specimen here. It's at its highest, geometrically designed. It comes from thousands of years of evolution of lettering prior to this time. And it's the in the, the first century, uh, the second century AD, right? So what it says, and this is another thing, is we all know as calligraphers that the Trajan inscription is really important, but a lot of people don't even know what it says or what it's about. For those of us who are tourists throughout Europe or have travelled to Europe for, for or live in Europe, luckily, you will see all over Europe the extent of the Roman Empire and letter forms such as SPQR can be seen right across Europe, right across Britain, uh, the full extent of the Imperial Roman Empire is still with us today. So the SPQR that is um, uh, ubiquitous across Europe comes from here. And what it means is the Senate and the populace QUE of Rome. Uh -huh. That's where the SPQR, S, sorry, the SPQR comes from. So let me tell you what this actually says. The Senate and the people of Rome dedicate this column to the Emperor Caesar, son of the divine Nerva, Nerva Trajanus, Augustus Germanicus, Dacius in his 17th year in the office of tribune. So that just means in his 17th year. Having been claimed six times as imperator, six times as consul, uh, as the consul father, to demonstrate what a great height this hill and this place was removed for such great works. And what the column depicts, the column itself depicts the Dacian Wars. So this is a great leader who's come in and he's, he's done all these uh, massive feats in his lifetime. But what we're interested in is the lettering and the lettering here is so important. But what I wanna show you in this particular column or the inscription um, are a couple of things. So Senatus Populus Q Roman means that uh, the Senate and the people of Rome. Mm -hmm. 
A lot of the, the words you can recognize because our English comes from Latin. So those people who have a first language of English will understand some of these words. Um, uh, even those who don't have a first language as English will understand these some of these Latin words because you understand and speak English. Um, this section here has a, a stroke across the top. And this also has a stroke and this has a stroke across the top. And it's that is what's called, uh, it's an indication mark or a truncation mark. It's actually an indication mark that these are Roman numerals and that these are Roman numerals and that these are Roman numerals. So now that you know that for those who didn't, uh, and some of you did, uh, this actually indicates 17. This indicates 6 and this indicates six as well. And there's also one very interesting thing about this column is that this person standing looking at the column or the average height of the person standing looking up to this column, this inscription, will look at it and what they see is not what we're looking at. What we are looking at is that this row is and this row these three rows are all of a certain height and sorry these these two rows are of a certain height this these two rows are slightly smaller slightly smaller and smaller again it's minute but what it does is that the person standing human height down on the ground can look up at this and the perspective shows this writing all at the one height. Now, we're talking the second century AD here. That is a feat that is geometrically um, insane. Uh, so we have, in the 21st century, we need to go back and look at these things and understand how intelligent and how wonderfully um, creative these people were. You won't look at the Trajan inscription ever again any differently. I mean, you will look at it very differently. You will not look at it the same. There are a few people around the world who I know who actually have, in, uh, have um, the, the tracings and the rubbings of the Trajan inscriptions. This is one that I saw at the Hunt Library at Carnegie Mellon University, um, where I was very fortunate to go and have a look uh, at a number of the works that are there. So I won't dwell on this area of the letter form, but I would like to impress upon you how important the Trajan inscription is on um, the letter form that we know and share every day on our computer. Every letter that we know and use today came from, developed from, evolved from these very formal, highly um, executed geometric Roman capitals. Uh, so, so get into it if you can. Um, the Origin of the Seraph is one of the pivotal books that you can read, and it's by Father Cadditch on the Trajan inscription and the importance of the Roman. Uh, oh, let me mention one thing about Roman, using that word Roman. We use Roman lettering. Roman means it's a generic term for capitals, lowercase, call them what you like, majuscules, minuscules. The letters of the alphabet that we use every day, and it doesn't matter what font you're using, what hand style you're using, they are Roman letter forms. This is something that some of my colleagues and I have had discussions about. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's just one of those um, global problems that we don't understand the, the true meaning of the word that some people think that the Roman letter is a capital versal or they might think it's a capital penned letter or it's a capital this. It's Roman is what we do. Um, Sinaiticus is a very, very important um, second century manuscript 
And one of the reasons it's really important is because it was one of the earliest books that had been created in codex form. Prior to the codex form is that the uh, page opening and closing, verso recto, verso recto, right and left. Uh, prior to this period, a lot of the um, manuscripts were in scroll form. So this is one of the remaining um, manuscript books that was important. And this is Greek letter form in um, Sinaiticus, the Codex Sinaiticus. I'm going to show you close up. Okay, this is one of the pages and I'm going to revisit this. Um, a lot of the manuscripts that we're going to look at are religious. Um, we have a lot to thank religion for. We have a lot to curse religion for. We have um, some of the most amazing manuscripts at our fingertips because of religion. Um, and we are looking at this wonderful communication system, the evolution of letter form. And this beautiful Greek unseal style can be yours to learn if you go back and study the Codex Sinaiticus. Um, I'm going to bring this back again towards the end of uh, the lecture. Uh, I'm going to bring in a little bit closer so you get an idea of the size of this letter form. So here it is. And I've got it a little millimeter uh, ruler beside the lettering here. So, and it's also indicating a sewing a sewing, sewing section. And the manuscript was written uh, on vellum. So the manuscripts that I'm going to talk about are important for their lettering and they're important for their, let me use this word again, I've already used it, pri prime specimens. So when I'm teaching a class, I tend to um, always go back to the prime specimen so that everybody in the class, no matter where they come from, anywhere in the world, if we all go back to the prime specimens, we're all going to have an equal starting point rather than going in to uh, a calligraphy book, like we were just met talking about before, um, you know, a bad exemplar. No one's going to know what a bad exemplar is, okay? And you can be forgiven for learning from a bad exemplar. That's okay. But if we encourage our students to go back to the earliest prime specimens, we're all, we've all got a fighting chance to, to do a really wonderful letter form. Having said that, this is not a prime specimen. The book is, um, this is a tiny little gospel book. Um, and what you can see here is just the handwriting of the scribe of the day who actually executed the book. And it just tells us inside the book that this is um, the gospel according to the evangelist John. OK, so that's all it is. It's a little it's a little gospel of St. John. And you can see how small it is. St. It's St. Cuthbert's gospel said to belong to the saint himself. But it's also known as the Stonyhurst gospel because it was located in Stonyhurst in the UK. So this is the inscription in the front, but the lettering, it's a prime specimen lettering. It's one of the earliest. Greek unseals that is in a relaxed style of letter form, okay? So we've gone from inscriptional letter form to formal Greek letter form and moving over into the handwriting of the day, this lovely um, formal unseal, right, that's been executed with a quill on vellum where the lines for writing have been scored with a stylus. And you can see those lines here. Keep in mind, this is a tiny book, tiny. So imagine how these, these must be only a couple of millimeters in height. 
Many of you will know the Lindisfarne Gospels. Walk into the British Library in London and you will see a major uh, electronic facsimile where you can, at large, it's huge, and you can turn every single page of the Lindisfarne Gospels. Um, one of the most major um, manuscripts ever created and there are a number of courses I know that, uh, and even you and Clayton, not even, but I know that you and Clayton is teaching a course specifically designed all around the Lindisfarne Gospels. We have a lot to learn from these manuscripts, from their illumination, from their gilding, from um, their pigment use, and from their design, and also from what we love best, the lettering. Here's a close-up of, uh, this is the gener uh, generatio, the, uh, the, generation, the genealogy of Christ. So this beautiful work um, is what we're interested in, but the prime specimen for an Irish half unseal or more correct term, sorry, an insular half unseal, not Irish, an insular half unseal, is what this letter form is called. It's in Latin. Um, it's a, a Christian manuscript and it is a prime specimen. So it and the Book of Kells uh, would be the two prime specimens that you would study if you wanted to study an insular half unseal. Speaking of, here we have the Cairo page in the Book of Kells. Again, a manuscript that you could go back to and looking at a page like this, you think, oh, my goodness, this is unbelievable. And um, so this is approximately uh, A3 size. Um, I can just say A3 because that'll give you an idea. It's not exactly that size, but it's not huge and it's not tiny. Um, and this is an X, P and an I. And again, knowing what the letters are that you're looking at is so very important. Uh, it says uh, here down the bottom, her generatio, which means the genealogy of Christ. And here we have a mixture of Greek, Byzantine. Um, we have a, a whole cosmopolitan mix of uh, European artwork in this one manuscript that was executed on a tiny island off Scotland called Iona. And we have a lot to owe to the people that created this. What I want you to think about in this talk with every image that I showed you, I want you to think or to remember that a human made these, a human did these with their hands, just like you can. Let me go in a little bit closer. I do a talk on the Book of Kells, but today I thought I'd just give you some of the little secrets. And on that page that you've just looked at, down the bottom is this tiny depiction of a couple of cats and a couple of rats, which of course would have been the animals around at the time. Um, and they're fighting over the ecumenical host here, which is a... a, a Catholicism thing, a religious thing, Christianity, sorry. But over here, we also have an otter with its head down in the water with the fish. And the fish, of course, was the symbol of Christ. So what's happening here is that the, the, the humans, the monks are telling us what's going on at the time. Um, I'd like to tell you more, but I, I don't have the time. But I will show you up the side of that Cairo page of the Book of Kells, all this pigment that's being used, the orpiment and the red ochre and the um, woad that's being used, the blue pigment, um, have all been um, used and employed to create this magnificent manuscript. And here you can see the angels uh, protecting um, Christ, the XPI. Christos. But the most important thing in the Book of Kells is the insular uh lettering to a calligrapher. 
And learning, if you want to learn a script of a Celtic nature, a true and honest insular unseal, you would go to the Book of Kells or you would go to um, the Lindisfarne Gospels. This is, I'll tell you what this is. I hope I don't go over time, but I'll tell you anyway. So when you're reading a manuscript like this, which is in Latin, you read this line and then you read the second line. Yes, yes, good. Oh, Then you read the next line. But we see this bird and we know as the reader not to continue along here, but to jump down to this line because the next meaning, the next part of the story goes from here to here. But because we've left all that space above there, you read to the end of the line, then you jump back to here, voluntatum, and then you get to there and you jump down to this line here. So not only are there a whole lot of secret ways of reading manuscripts, they are telling us how to read the manuscripts. This is a term called under the wing. And it means that very thing that I just talked about. So these people were clever. These people were human. They were inventive. And we can learn a lot from them. These are works on vellum. And the reason we have them is because they were written on vellum. Um, the Book of Kells here again, and this will be the last image of the Book of Kells. And you can see the employment here of this very, very bright and shiny pigment that is not gold. There is no gold in the Book of Kells. There is just orpiment, which is um, arsenic trisulfide. So it was very poisonous. Prime specimens. Uh, here is one of the most beautiful formal unseal styles. If you want to, to learn the Vespasian Psalter or the Rule of St. Benedict are two Psalters that you can go to for, um, uh, sorry, not Psalters. This is the Rule of St. Benedict, um, which are the rules that are set out by the Benedictine monks in their monasteries. So every Benedictine monastery had a manuscript like this that had the rules, right? But it's one of the finest and highest prime specimens of um, a, a beautiful formal unseal. Mm -hmm. You want to learn a good unseal? You go back to the source. Uh, again, you want to learn a really good Carolingian hand? You go back to the source. So the Granville Bible uh, is one of the, the greatest manuscripts uh, that is a Caroline manuscript or Carolingian as we know it these days. Let me tell you that the, um, the St. John's Bible, um, um, Donald Jackson and his team went back to a Carolingian manuscript, studied it, every scribe studied the uh, Carolingian, early Carolingian, and he formed a Carolingian style of letter form to be one of the most legible hands ever evolved, which is why he used it in the St. John's Bible. Um, Sheila Waters also in Under Milk Wood went back and studied the Carolingian hand and created her manuscript Under Milk Wood using the Carolingian style because it's one of the most, as I just said, legible of all scripts. Um, of course, as calligraphers, we want to learn versals. Uh, and again, one of the best things to do is, is uh, I don't want to do myself out of a job here, um, not necessarily go to a, 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 an exemplar or a book of exemplars of, of latterly um, versals, but go back to the source. And here you can see one of the most beautiful um, 10th century manuscripts with uh, some of the finest versals I think I've ever seen. Um, so in, in classes, um, let me say this of a, a competent calligraphy teacher, uh, they will have um, 
offerings for you that are historically based, right? And one of the most important manuscripts of all uh, is the Ramsey Psalter, because it's from this time period, the 10th century manuscript, the Ramsey Psalter, that we get the most legible of all hands. It's a Caroline manuscript. A Caroline just means it comes from the time period of Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne uh, in the 10th, 9th, in the 9th century, late 1800s, uh, had a, a renaissance, but an early renaissance before the big renaissance of, um, uh, of the arts and the sciences and music. And um, the Ramsey Psalter comes from that time period. And what you're looking at here is the manuscript that Edward Johnston, and if you don't know who he is, don't worry, because you're going to find out all about him in just a minute, um, used to create his foundational hand. Most beginners come to calligraphy, they will learn foundational hand, broad nib calligraphy, um, I'm talking about. We'll, we'll come across a hand called foundational hand. Well, this manuscript that you're looking at right now, the Ramsey Psalter, uh, is the manuscript that Edward Johnston studied and built or based his, um, his foundational hand upon. So again, if you're going to learn foundational hand, you could learn from your tutor the foundational hand as they know it, but you should also look at not only Edward Johnston's foundational hand, but where in history he got his foundational hand from, and you're looking at it right now. I'm happy to ask, have questions later on. So any questions, just, you know, pile them up. Um, I've done a lot of study overseas. Uh, I've done a lot of study here in Australian archives and libraries. It's amazing what's come out to Australia over <laughs> years. Um, but whenever I go away, I always try to you go and find these quite obscure um, you know, manuscripts if I can. And this is a really gorgeous little one. It just sit, fits in the palm of your hand and it's a Psalter. And a Psalter, for those who don't know, is a prayer book. A Psalter is a prayer book. Um, and so this one is a, 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 a Psalter and a hymnal. And Psalters sometimes will have Psalms in them as well. So, so hymns and prayers. This is one of the most gorgeous finds. Um, when I was just, I just, the way to get to see something like this is you ask. And that's all I did. I wrote to the uh, librarian at St. Paul's Cathedral to ask, could I have a look at any 10th century manuscripts? Um, so I did that, which is what I like to do. But I also looked at a few uh, much later manuscripts, and this is one of them. It's a gorgeous little book. Um, Oh dear. Excuse me, my phone's gone off. Let me turn that off. How dare that happen? I beg your pardon, everybody. Um, yeah, so what you're looking at here is um, uh, like a little antiphonal, and you can see some beautiful versals. So we're looking here at the 14th century. So we're moving along away from the very round and open style that became extremely legible. Um, and we've moved into something a little bit more condensed. Uh, in a modern day, we would call this uh, like a rotunda style or an early black letter style. Uh, it's written on vellum. You can see the score marks um, where the scribe has drawn the lines. But in here, where this, this very shiny bit that you can see here, you can't see the whole thing, but the whole letter is gold and the light has only just picked up some of it and it is stunningly beautiful and again as I said it's only tiny over here you can see quite clearly the scored lines and how the scribes actually worked they didn't work on the line like we do they worked above the line and look how beautifully that their their letter form absolutely sings 
and it sings because it's not restricted to two lines, a baseline and a waist line. So again, I emphasize to you all that we can learn a lot from history. As I go through places, I keep my eyes open for lettering. And here's a beautiful little tomb. Um, and it's a story of uh, someone who had, Anto Antoni, who had a, um, uh, this is his, his little tomb. Um, and I just like looking at, at letter form. And what's really interesting is because this is in the 1300s, and we've just looked at the first and second century AD. We've looked at the very formal and geometrically designed, what a big difference there is between what was done in the, in the first century and what's been done in the 13th century. Oh, for, sorry, this is the 14th century. Um, and here we have, um, so be it, amen at the end. Uh, I really love looking at all the quirky letter form that I see through uh, all over the place. And I take photos. This is one that I saw in Venice. And I thought, how strange is it that this scribe who's carved all this letter form and then put this, this curl on the bottom of the letter Q, it's, it's really quite interesting, isn't it? And and how wonderful to see the carved um, AE here, what we, we know as a diphthong. Um, and in some languages, it's a letter all of its own with different pronunciations, of course. Um, keep your eyes out when you're traveling. Take photos of letter forms. Again, look at the mastery of this particular scribe who's got a, a finite space and a lot of information to put into that space. This is another photo that I took just at the, um, the arms castle in Venice, the Castello Arsenale. And the scribe has used their, um, their nestling of letter forms to put them inside. So this, for instance, reads D-E-M-O-L-I-N-O. Um, so you can see their, um, their intelligence and their creativeness. Here we have, for instance, just so that you can get an idea of what this, how the scribe was thinking. Um, here we've got an O and the R comes next, then the N, but then there's an A as well, and then an R and an I. So it's a way of saving space and how wonderful and how clever. Um, a lot of calligraphers do it these days and we think, wow, they're fantastic, but they've been doing it for centuries, trust me. And what I love about this photograph is the, the, the little bird wire that they've got across here to stop the birds. So the, here we have the 21st century and the <laughs> I've come back to this one just to, to give us a, a, a clear picture of what, what we saw earlier on and then what we, we're seeing in the mid-centuries. Um, and from here, we're going to move very quickly through to the 20th century. I am going to move very quickly because we have approximately an hour. Is that right? Or would you? does it matter if we go over? Yeah, we can go over, no problem. All righty. Uh, feel free to drop out if you if you need to. Okay, uh, my, my uh, most favourite uh, italic that I teach is the Benedino uh, Cataneo. Oh, I've got a spelling mistake there. I didn't realise that. I must have done it in a hurry. Um, Benedino Cataneo. His italic is absolutely perfect. It's upright. It's, uh, well, it has a slight slope. Uh, it's one of the finest italics. He was a part of that massive Italian renaissance of lettering um, where the writing masters, the printing press had been um, developed and they were able to use metal plates to get as much um, uh, publication as possible. But this italic in particular uh, is... Um, 
is of its highest nature. Um, so this is one to look out for. Uh, also the Bembo um, italic is, a, again, these are prime specimens. There's lots of what we call transitional scripts, scripts that come and go between all these specimens that I'm talking about. I don't want you to be on overload, but have a look at all the wonderful, um, well, have a look at all the wonderful ampersands. They're everywhere in this manuscript, ampersands everywhere. Here we have lots and lots of ligatures, for example, look at this. And if you don't know what you're looking at, it doesn't matter, ask somebody. Ask somebody who you think um, uh, might know what it is. Uh -huh. So here we have the Espirito. Here we have the ST, not an F, but an ST. Um, oh, here we've got Ronaldo. We're into the soccer. And on the next image, you've even got um, Benedino Catania actually was channeling me when he was writing because in that manuscript of his is, there I am in black and white, but look at these beautiful ampersands. This italic is, again, it's the prima donna. We move into the copper plate. And it was from the copper plate, the early engravings, that the broad nib writing masters wrote their templates backwards to transfer onto a copper plate to be printed in the hundreds so that people could learn to write. What's interesting about this little image that's slightly blurred, it was this part here that I wanted you to see. Through copper plate engraving, a publisher was able to bring script and flourishing to the public, particularly students, as they were impossible to produce as type. This is from George Bickham's The Universal Penman, published in segments from 1735 to 1743. We all know George Bickham the fantastic and great engraver and bringer of the copper plate to thousands. This particular uh, style of letter form was designed by Edward Johnston, who I mentioned earlier, who designed the foundational hand. The London Underground, for anyone that has visited will know this, even if you haven't visited, you will know this um, particular style. This is the man himself, Edward Johnston, who lived from 1872 to, seven, to 1944. He died at the age of 72. This is some, these are some photos that I took these two uh, at in um, Ditchling at uh, a place called The Barn, which houses a number of Edward Johnston's works. Also uh, in Ditchling, as a place that I have a photograph of that if you ever go to the UK or if you would like to go and you want it, we don't need, if you want a reason to go, go to Ditchling. It is the home of um, the, the, the major arts and crafts community um, of the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, um, and the big renaissance or the big uh, revival of calligraphy. So here we have Edward Johnston, a very stiff and upper looking Englishman here, but I can tell you he was more human than human. Here he is with his cat, a photo often not seen. Um, and we all know what cats are like when, as calligraphers. But this man is responsible for a great revival in the early part of the 20th century. Not only is he responsible, there are others, but Edward Johnston had far-reaching um, uh, tentacles, let's say, he went over to Europe and taught a number of calligraphers there, a very important one in Anna Simons in Germany, who went on to teach uh, a great number of very well-known lettering artists. 
Uh, and this is a piece of Edward Johnston. So I think we need to look at the work of people like Edward Johnston and we can see it sits in a certain time period. But what I'd really like you to take away from today's um, talk is something we were talking about earlier today in our Meet the Mentors and the Mentees, um, that passion and that enthusiasm and that want to share for the future. Well, it's people like uh, all those people that worked on those manuscripts, people like Edward Johnston and all the people I'm about to introduce you to now. This is a, a, a photograph of Ditchling. I have visited four times. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, it's that pilgrimage that I like to at least go and see what's going on and, and have a look at the new craft works and artworks that have been created. Uh, it's in the south, southern, southeastern part of the UK, not far from Brighton. Um, the lettering, of course, we find everywhere. And this is a very, very common um, object. It's, a, it's a, a roller for a tennis court, the old fashioned sand tennis courts. And here we have Eric Gill um, having carved into it, come all you false young men, do not leave me here to complain. Eric Gill, of course, was a student of Edward Johnston's. Here we have the work of David Jones, who was also uh, one of the uh, wonderful artists and craftsmen, poet, writer, uh, painter, war correspondent, um, who lived and worked in Ditchling. And this is his style of letter form. Um, he would, I'm, I'm very, he was a very private person and he would never consider that his work would be looked upon uh, as, as we're looking at it today. Um, but he, he has been a great source of inspiration for people like myself, uh, like our very dear friend, Yukimi, um, um, for, uh, so there's Yukimi and myself have been teaching David Jones' work for a long time now. Um, Eve Leterme has also been teaching. I mean, we've been um, quite taken by the particular style that this gentleman created uh, in the early 1900s. And this piece is written in both Welsh and Latin. So we have a line of Welsh, a line of Latin, a line of Welsh and a line of Latin in very muted um, colors. And this has been um, painted onto Chinese white, onto a Chinese white background on paper. So you can see now all of a sudden we're starting to get into a little bit of um, modern style of letter form. These are students' examples of taking Edward, taking um, David Jones' style. Uh -huh. So we're using his style of writing. He says, it, uh, David Jones says, every single one of his letter forms, he found a precedent in a in a manuscript, in an early manuscript. So that was interesting because when I went through his books, I found something like 16 Gs, for example. One of my greatest um, uh, people who I have looked up to their work and them as a person, Irene Wellington, uh, you're going to see she was a student of Edward Johnston's and you can see here her foundational hand. For those of you who know, Edward Johnston's foundational hand, and then you looking at, if you know foundational hand well, you can then see Irene's foundational hand, and Irene went on to teach numerous people throughout the UK, and then you look at their foundational hands, and you can actually see this lineage of people around the world, um, and to think that someone like Sheila Waters uh, went to the States, um, and that there's a groundswell of this early English tradition that has moved around the world. And like Australia being a colony of the UK, of England, I should say, um, were 
you know, we also got that English tradition uh, out here, but we're also fortunate to be able to have our own Indigenous swell of artwork uh, that influences our work, and we also have influences from Europe and the and uh, the Americas. Irene Wellington uh, did the most extraordinary and beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, I studied on my Churchill Fellowship, where I was searching out her work, uh, particularly in the UK, which took me to study at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Just because it's a museum doesn't mean it doesn't have lettering. The British Library, um, Buckingham Palace, and the Royal Archive. You can go and find these things. You just need to ask. Irene Wellington's Bailiffs of Lid, I had never seen up until uh, 2019. In, I'd never seen it in the flesh. I had only studied it uh, via a book or books. And to finally actually see this place, uh, this, this piece, which is magnificent, it's quite, it's about, if you imagine me as a sort of normal human being, my arm spans, it's as wide as my arm spans, okay? Uh, it's a huge piece of work and a magnificent piece of work. If you're ever in Lid, that's where it is. You can see I'm showing you Irene Wellington's work. It is quite diverse and extremely beautiful, precise. Um, doesn't get much better. Uh, just two photos of her, one in her younger days and one uh, a little older. And I like to show you photos of the actual people as well as their work so that you can, you can attach the personality uh, to the work. Rudolf Koch, one of the finest German lettering artists, um, was the designer of, of course, the Norland Hand which is an extremely popular um, calligrapher's style of letter form, I urge you to go back to Rudolf Koch's original um, Norland if you want to learn it. Or learn it through a contemporary tutor, but ask them for Koch's original. I have to say I am extremely impressed by uh, this particular graphic designer, one of the great German artists. So just a couple of images of his works. Very has made a great impression on me as a calligrapher. You, you can see I've taken these photos because um, you can see the reflection in the glass and you can see how I've tried to get an angle that doesn't give me a reflection. But you can see reproductions of these. So what's happened over all these years is that the letter form has evolved. It's moved away from the Trajan inscription and into lowercase um, letter forms. Another very fine favourite of certainly uh, myself and Eukimis uh, is Herman Killian. Um, not only, of course, the two of us, a number of other contemporary calligraphers, Carl Raws, for instance, is very big on Herman Killian. Um, And here is just some of his work where there is a great knowledge of Roman letter form in its purest form from trade and inscription. But then the use of different tools, just like um, my lovely mentee Susian was using her computer and her graphic um, expertise to create a piece of work for exhibition, so too people like Killian using tools that were not designed for calligraphy um, to do their work. I just think it's amazing. 
again, you can see how impressed I am or how impressed his work is on me uh, because I'm showing you so many images. Uh, Okay, a few of my great favourites. Sheila Waters. This is an early photo of Sheila and Peter. Uh, obviously, um, she's showing him what he should have done or he's telling her what she should be doing. <laughs> you know, I really should have asked her. It's times like this I really miss her. One of my greatest mentors. Uh, this is a piece of a magnificent book that Sheila Waters created under Milk Wood, which is a play by Dylan Thomas, which many of you will know. But I wanted to show you a close up of the paintings uh, that she, she did uh, for the front cover. Uh, the, it's not, sorry, it's the inside of the front cover. The front cover of the book is um, embossed. So can you imagine what you're looking at here embossed? Well, it just blows me away. To have mentors like this, uh, I feel totally privileged. And this is inside. Again, Sheila went back to that beautiful Carolingian style so that she could use it in a contemporary way. She talks about that. Uh, she talked about that. And again, in class, a little blurred, but it's nice to have a photo of Sheila in class. Um, uh, one of my greatest mentors, Gaynor Goff. Um, we talked a little earlier about Gaynor. Her books are fantastic. Oh, I just noticed there's one sitting underneath there. Um, that's her calligraphy made easy. <laughs> she had no um, say over the title of that book, Calligraphy Made Easy. Um, the publisher called it that because they wanted it to walk off the shelf. It was going to walk off the shelf anyway, but Calligraphy Made Easy, we know it's not that easy. Um, but Calligraphy School that she wrote as well is a very, very fine book she wrote with Anna Ravenscroft. Uh, my tutor for two years. Uh, this is a very early piece of hers. I'm showing you some of my friends and mentors' works that are their early works. And I'm showing you their early works because we can see their, mod their, their contemporary works. But to look at their early works and to know that this was done in the 1980s where there's this build-up of texture and very creative um, you know, that's a long time ago now. Uh, and, you know, the, the wheel isn't being invented. It's already been invented, if you know what I mean. Okay, we do not only have to work on a broadsheet or in a book. You know, step outside the, um, the square. Actually, this is Gainagoff, sorry. Uh, Ewan Clayton, uh, who I think is one of the finest and most creative lettering artists um, alive. This is a very early piece of his. Again, I've gone back to early so that you can see that how, how in the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, these calligraphers were experimenting and moving forward uh -huh, back then. Um, just a couple of his. These next few images um, actually belong to a, a book, but the book is on a wall. So it's uh, you'll see these pieces. And I'm just going to throw, a, throw um, a random piece in here because when I saw this for the first time, it reminded me of the uh, Codex Sinaiticus, all right? So I had that feeling of the second century and the 20th, 21st century um, all coming together when I saw that piece. So these pages you can see here are in um, Ewan's book and I'll show you those images now. 
It's called A Book of Hours from the Vernal Equinox. And so I just showed you some of those images. And I think I've got a close up here. Okay. So the alphabet is moving and continually moving forward. If we don't experiment, like we were speaking earlier today about Yukimi and experimenting and in, in, in learning from nature to design letter form or to take our ideas and our, our learning forward by studying other elements around us or essence of life and using it in our work, then only then can we move forward. These are just some images of mine and I'm going very quickly through these because these are just some of the ways that I've implemented my work over the years. This is a book designed for the Folio Society in London, uh, which originally started as um, you know, they wanted a fully blown, coloured, illuminated letter on every single page. But of course, they couldn't afford to do that. And so what I did was I used you, um, not you, and um, Owen Jones, uh, um, turn of the century uh, style of letter form, 1001 Illuminated Letters, which is a great book. If you want a really good book for uh, illumination, go back to Owen Jones, 1001 Illuminated illuminated letters um, and you can see here that I've taken my line work to directly from um, that book and that's why I've put his little image in here and so you can see how I've implemented that for the publication of um, the uh, divine love by Julian of Norwich uh, and of course because there were so many A's in the book, starting the chapters, I had to do five different A's. Mm -hmm. So I just did a whole lot of different A's. So gold, working with gold. So when you're a calligrapher, one of the things that we want to do is to work with gold. Um, and of course, there's a number of ways of working with gold. This little piece at the top here is a lot bigger than what you can see here. And there's burn, raised and burnished gesso um, gold leaf all the way around the outside here, which of course is difficult to, um, to photograph. So gesso, gold leaf, traditional on vellum is one way to go. That's this one. Um, this is uh, gummamoniacum, which is another traditional way. So if you go back and you look at illuminated manuscripts, there's two major uh, traditional ways of gilding. One is gummamoniacum, uh, which is a natural substance that was uh, soaked and ground to create your glue or your gilding size. Uh, and that is this one here. It's beautiful to use. It's absolutely fail-proof, unlike burnished and raised uh, gilding on gesso, which is not quite so straightforward. Um, this one is actually a modern contemporary uh, gold size, so it makes no difference. Uh, if you want to go back and study traditionally, go right ahead. There's plenty of information out there. And I can guide you to, or, or all of us can, you know, there's, there's, there's a great deal of information and I can guide you to any uh, number of sources. Um, there are quite a few modern gilding sizes. You know, eat your heart out, go and have fun. This is also a modern gilding size, but this technique is called scraffito. And so we're scratching directly through the gold leaf and into the background behind it. So contemporary. We can go as much gold as you like. Golden colour. Experiment to your heart's content. Don't wait for a tutor to say, you can do this. Just go right ahead and do it. We work in books. 
We work in books that are traditional and very valuable. Um, this is a book that I helped work on. It's called The Declaration Against Modern Slavery. One of the things that I like to do as a calligrapher is to tell a story of our own time. And this is one of those projects that is so extremely precious where page after page after page commits to the uh, eradication of contemporary uh, modern slavery. You know, there's nothing to say that in a hotel where all the tourists are staying that there's not a half a dozen slaves. Okay. And this is an example of the, the style that I used um, for the book to make it so the to make it legible for a long, long period of time. Uh, and this is the build-up of the book. In fact, there were two books that were created. So I was um, quite moved about, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, uh, the lass from China who was very um, moved by making, well, very interested in making books. Um, books is sub books are the future for what it is that we do. So make as many books as you can. Another one of the things that I studied apart from calligraphy, of course, was book binding, painting, printmaking. Um, heraldry is part of what we do as calligraphers. Um, it, it is all part of a calligrapher's trade. If you haven't got a heraldry project on the go, um, do. That's all I can say. Get your name, get your armorial bearings. If you don't have armorial bearings, make them up and create your own coat of arms. That would be a great exercise for anybody that wants to get into heraldry. Again, I'm going to be very quick now. These are a lot of documents that have been created by myself for various government jobs, including the one on the right that was um, quite a few years ago now created for the Queen. National Apology for Forced Adoption uh, on in the centre there and another apology. And the apologies that I've created in my job as a calligrapher for the federal government here in Australia uh, uh, on a public exhibition at Parliament House in Canberra. So when you all come to visit, make sure you go there and you too can have a look at these documents. One of my greatest mentors and friends, Dennis Brown, again, a very early piece of his. Carl Roars. I want you to think outside the box. <laughs> Look at this magnificent piece of work, an old wicker chair that needed a new base. And so this is what he did. Sharon Zeugen, great friend, fantastic calligrapher. Watch out for her new book. One of the greatest contemporary calligraphers. This is a, her writing, her grackle writing. Uh, again, something modern, something moving, something going forward. And I can tell you this was created at least 10 to 15 years ago. My gold moving in such a direction that is so exciting. Uh, they're weathergrams. Everybody knows weathergrams. If you don't know what a weathergram is, look it up. Uh, I use weathergrams, um, sadly, for my friends and my family or for anyone who passes away, and I leave them out in the weather. Um, they, they mean a lot to me, and then I bring them in when they can no longer hang and collect them. Graffiti. I love graffiti. I think we're all graffiti artists. I mean, every blank surface I ever see, I just want to put something on it. If you want to go and study, uh, one of the best places is, is the Scribewerkstatt in uh, Klingspor in Offenbach uh, in Germany, the Karl Gorg and Maria Hufer archive. 
um, you will not be disappointed if you make that uh, trip into Offenbach, not far out of Frankfurt. And these are some examples of works that have impressed me. Some are my students, some are not my students, like um, Karl Georg Hufer. Just quickly now, one of the finest examples of a contemporary book that I've seen done is this one by Godfrey Pott, um, a letter collection. You too can study this. I've just noticed some of my friends have been in um, at the Klingspore. Um, Yukimi has visited the Klingspore. It's really wonderful to see my friends and colleagues all go to these places that we've been to. It's sort of, as I said, it's a small community globally that we live in. And these works that you're looking at are held in there. Um, and you too can go and study these. Uh, again, you look at something like this and you can see that the depth of study that uh, in this particular instance, it's Gottfried Pott, has undertaken uh, to create. See, this is this is first century um, um, trade in column inscription skeleton Roman capitals. Um, you can see the depth of study in all of these works. And it's just the different tools that we use. This is all in the one book. Got uh, Rudolf Koch's original um, Norland, created in 1923. And this is an article that I have. Um, and I just wanted to show you the top line there. Quickly now, I won't say anything about these. Uh, again, it's just um, examples of Hoch's work that I am so impressed by. Arnold Bank, uh, Arnold Bank American calligrapher, um, who lived very uh, right through the middle of last century. Um, Anne Heckel one of the finest English calligraphers alive. Her works are superb. Uh, you too can study her work uh, through the Craft Study Centre in, in um, I studied there in Bath, but it's in Farnham now in the UK. Look Anne Heckel up. Um, her work is amazing. All this raised and burnished uh, gilding here, you can buy a number of her posters that are still available. Um, again, one of the finest English lettering artists or one of the finest lettering artists I know, have the pleasure to know. Uh, here's a close-up of that. And look at that beautiful burnished and raised gilding. She was a great uh, mentor or is a great mentor to me. Thomas Ingmeyer, who I studied with for a year on his very first Graphos course. Again, an extremely early piece of Thomas Ingmeyer when he started to move away from formal uh, calligraphy into experimenting. And that's the key. It's the experimenting um, and learning from your experiments to move forward. This is, believe it or not, pencil. Again, pencil. This was a piece that I did for COVID. Um, you can see there, um, MMXX. Um, suffering and loss and yearning and missing people. And yet we had support and help and love and joy. It was the spirit of the time. We're nearly through. I find things like stone carvings, and then I use 
use things that I see outside to create um, works. I do a lot of very retro 60s type stuff. Moving forward doesn't mean that you have to look. <laughs> you can look back to move forward. Uh, I'm just going now right to the end. Uh, these, of course, are just works of mine. Again, on vellum, lots of documents. Yves Le Term, uh, some of his early experiments, so that you know where he's at now. These early works of his uh, was groundbreaking, avant-garde. Brody Newton-Swander, again, avant-garde. Someone you will never have heard of. No, of course you have. Ronnie Arliff, one of my very fine friends, Australian calligrapher, carved into a set of botanics and um, set them on fire. Wonderful works by my friends here. Students' works. Pushing boundaries. Students' works in um, Bad Sodensal Munster in Germany when I was um, teaching there. I think it says a lot more about the students than it says about me. The work was stunning. Uh, Luca Barcelona, uh, a real mover and shaker in our field. Magnificent works, you know, forgetting the broadsheet. Let's go bigger than that. Massimo Palello, again, a fine, fine calligrapher who's broken all the boundaries. Again, these are some of his early experimental works. And I'm just about to wind up. Annie Sakali, this whole book is an original hand-lettered book from beginning to end. It's quite thick. Um, again, quite, I'd like to actually show you right through the book, but of course I can't. Um, Loredana uh, Zaga, of course, uh, is one of, uh, again, one of the greatest mover and shakers, one of the young mover and shaker calligraphers um, that I've had the pleasure to meet. And I'm going to finish off, um, this is just some of her work, but I'm going to finish off with a, a little visual piece of hers, uh, a very, very short few seconds video. Um, unfortunately, you will not have the sound. Um, I have the sound, but, but you won't have the sound. But I think just looking at her, you'll, you'll get it. Okay. friends finally it's over I'm very late <laughs> I'm very no, sorry you're not. you're not you're not late it's all good wow Gemma thank you that is an amazing ride through time amazing thank yeah you so much. like 2,000 years in an hour and a half <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's what we do and I hope that you can take away from that some really wonderful inspiration to move forward and to look back. Mm, absolutely. You know, something you said about there is, you know, nothing new that hasn't been done. 
<laughs> I mean, now I understand, you know, when I look at some of the examples you've shown us that were decades old and it yes. feels so fresh. Oh my mm. word. Mm. Uh, what an amazing um, just wealth of inspiration. I mean, I, I mean, look at the chat, you know, everyone is saying uh, amazing, you know, thank you so much. And that, that's just, I don't know what to say. I mean, now it's time to study. <laughs> I, I just, I just think that we're so fortunate to have this wonderful global experience and community now, and particularly the last three, four years, it's been amazing and amazing for people like me to find so many young and wonderful calligraphers out there. But I also feel that a lot of the calligraphy world has not looked back, right back. And, and learned a lot from the past. I think I learned that myself a long time ago was to go back. Um, so it's a bit like back to the future, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, there you have it. We should uh, call this lecture back to the future, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Thank you. That was amazing. So now, you know, ladies and gentlemen, it's our turn to buckle down and go to the history books. <laughs> And I think a lot of these books are on archives, right? I mean, some of them yeah. have been digitized. Um, it yeah. should, you know, if we were to search for them online. I mean, thankfully, we have the internet and that enables us to time travel. And um, if I can just quickly say, I don't think we've got time for questions. We need to wind it up. However, if there's a particular thing that you're interested in and you can't find the information, just drop me an email and, you know, I'll get to it. Um, you know, I've got some time on my hands over the next two weeks because I haven't moved into our new house. So you can write to me, I might answer you. Um, you know, I can help or we can help. Thank you, Gemma, that's very kind. But uh, everyone, please give time for her to respond because she is, uh, you know, uprooting and replanting herself in a different state. So. Yeah, thank you, Gemma. That was really awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, everybody, so, so very much. I can't see you. Um, thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now.